Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Welcome to this special edition of the Physical Society Colloquium, co-presented with the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music, Media, and Technology. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where resonances, beats, noise, and the music of the spheres are normal lunchtime conversation topics. If you're in the Zoom session and you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This afternoon, we will have a 45-minute talk, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask a question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors will be asked to log out of the Zoom session, and undergrads, grads, and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session, will be invited to the après colloque a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Robert Brandenberger to introduce the speaker. Robert. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Good, so it's my great pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Stefan Alexander. So Stefan has two careers. On one hand, he's professor of physics at Brown University, but on the other, he's a semi-professional jazz saxophonist. Now, as a physicist, I can't comment on his accomplishments in jazz, but I'll say a few things about his uh, background in physics. So Stefan was an undergraduate at Haverford College. And after that, he enrolled at Brown University as a PhD student. Uh, after his PhD degree, he spent postdoctoral years at Imperial College and at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And then, he started as a professor at Penn State University. He became EE e. Just Professor at Dartmouth College. And for a number of years now, he's been a professor at Brown University. Stefan has made many fundamental contributions to theoretical cosmology, particularly he's developed many new ideas. For example, he uh, was one of the first to develop models of cosmological inflation based on some stringy ingredients called D brains. He invented a new baryogenesis mechanism. He did fundamental work on polarization of the microwave background. And uh, 20 years before the time, he suggested that one might use machine learning to explore large scale structure. So he, Stefan uh, is a National Geographic emerging explorer. He was a TEDx speaker. He is now president of the National Society of Black Physicists, and he's author of a popular science book called The Jazz of Physics. So, Stefan, welcome. Take it away. Um, thank you, um, Robert, and thank you, um, Dr. Koish. And, um, and it's a great pleasure to be given this um, joint colloquium. Um, first of all, I have very, very warm and a special relationship with um, McGill and the city of Montreal. I, I'm a regular, um, you know, let's say I, uh, after, after I visit the department and engage in physics conversation with many members of the department in the coffee room, I enjoy going out to um, the jazz clubs and even sitting in a couple of sessions. You guys have some fantastic local talent um, across the musical stratosphere in Montreal. So. I terribly miss you all and look forward to being out there when the dust settles. So um, on that, let, let's begin the talk. And um, oh, I forgot to say one thing. Um, Robert did mention that Robert was my PhD advisor. And this is not an inside game, okay? <laughs> I know that. This, so I just wanted to let, um, just say that, you know, couldn't have asked for a better um, advisor, mentor, and collaborator. Um, in fact, whenever I get stuck in a physics problem and I have a crazy idea, um, Robert is, is there to, um, to tell me that it is crazy, but um, march ahead. So on that note, um, <laughs> um, let's begin. Um, so what I'm gonna do is share a screen and oh, pick my talk out from, from share a screen. And I'm not gonna go on full mode here. All right. So today we're gonna explore, um, <clears throat> you know, you probably heard about the term called music of the spheres. Uh, and while I'll, I'll say a bit, little bit more about about that, and and this is based a lot of this talk, this colloquium. It'll be based on. Um, if you're interested in more details, because we're limited, I have 45 minutes to do my dance here. Um, 
um, to check out my book, The Jazz of Physics. Um, okay, so moving forward. Oh, so when I was a young, so this talk is really gonna go through more of a personal journey because I don't wanna put people to sleep. So I figure storytelling is a good thing. And embedded in the storytelling, this is in the tradition of great physicists like, like Richard Feynman, where they tell stories and embedded in the stories are, is the information, is the, are the concepts. So my story begins as a kid growing up in the Bronx, New York. And during that time, this was during the 80s, when hip hop music was being created in the Bronx, in my, in, in my neighborhood, actually. And I grew up in a situation where my father was a taxi driver and my mother was a nurse. Um, and so, you know, in the environment I grew up in, and I was a very inquisitive child, like many, like many children, um, looking at even empty space in front of me and wondering, well, what is this thing, right? Um, so I definitely had scientific tendencies, but when I looked around, the role models of people that I saw that looked like me were usually musicians or athletes or entertainers and even, um, you know, not too, you know, some, some shady characters, to say the least. Um, so I kind of grew up in a situation where, and I think this is often the case with young, with young people, it's like, you know, we look out to the world and we look out and the messages that we get from society. And sometimes the, those messages say that, you know, based on maybe what you look like, you know, how you talk, how you dress, you know, your personality, that you're not really fit to be this. or you're more of this kind of person or you're this. And for me, it was definitely the case that, yes, I did grow up in a musical family and maybe it was expected for me to be a musician, but I deep down was curious about science. And so I grew up with this dichotomy or this tension as to who, who am I? Am I a musician? Am I, should I do this? Should I do that? And all, along this, you know, along my, this journey of my, of this talk, we will see how this tension transforms and doesn't ever get resolved in a sense. But in fact, it's a tension that's driving this journey and some of the things that I came to discover throughout this journey. Am I a scientist or am I a musician? And along the way, there were certain inspirations and people that helped me maybe um, form my own identity and maybe not embrace, embrace the scientist and the musician in me, but figure out how to navigate that tension. And the first was this guy named Rakim, who was one of the, probably emerged to be um, one of the legendary and the, the best rap artists in history. And he was known, he was part of a, of a, um, a group of um, spiritual seekers in, the, in New York City called the Five Percenters. And they, the way, they, when, when they rapped, it was about what they call supreme mathematics. And so they would rap about matters that have to do with, you know, sci-fi related things, science and, you know, so we're looking here at one of his most famous raps called My Melody. And when, when you listen to this, I want you to think about the you know star formation, how a star forms and then maybe explode into a supernova. That he's making an illusion to maybe that, but his microphone is the star. And he goes, that's what I'm saying. I drop science like a scientist. My melody is a code the very next episode. Has a mic off in the store and ready to explode. I keep the mic in Fahrenheit. Freeze MCs to make him colder. The listener system is kicking like solar. Now I remember I was a 15 year, 14 year old kid you know, being va validated by, you know, uh, someone who was popular that all the other young people looked up to. And instead of rapping about being in a gang or, you know, something, he was rapping about science. And so for me, to my young years, Rakim made it okay for me to say, it's okay for me to, to be interested in science. Um, the other person was Albert Einstein. I was aware of Albert Einstein when I was a youngster. We went to the museum. Museum of Natural History, and I got lost in the museum as a, as a kid, and I chanced on this picture of this guy with crazy hair with some equations. And Einstein really captured my imagination because he showed me, he shows us that being a scientist, you don't have to fit into any kind of box. Einstein, you know, was known for his humanity, his personality, playing the violin, you know, tripping on a bicycle. I mean, so when we see Einstein, people like Einstein, scientists like Einstein, we see that you can be you know, a great scientist as well as be your own person. Um, and that was important for me to see as, you know, as a person that did see himself as different um, and not really fitting in anywhere, so to speak. And I think many of us, you know, have the, the, those feelings from time to time. 
The other one was John Coltrane. Um, the, so God, many of us know John Coltrane as probably, you know, well, you know, um, radio personalities, various people were asked to list the top musical um, recording of last century. And it was almost unanimous that it was John Coltrane's album, A Love Supreme. So, but, but what a lot of people don't know about John Coltrane is if you look at that diagram to the right there, that's his hand-drawn diagram um, where he was trying to, again, it looks kind of like some kind of math, right? It looks like some kind of hidden code. And in fact, John Coltrane was a big fan of Albert Einstein and anything he can get his hands on about Einstein, he would, he would read it. And he once told a great composer that, um, and this great composer actually told me this, this guy, David Amram, told me that Coltrane told Amram that he, he understood what Einstein did for physics. And he wanted to do what Einstein did for physics for music. So what did Einstein do for physics? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but Einstein was able to use symmetries and invariants, right? to codify and put that at the forefront of physics, to formulate the laws of physics. General relativity is about invariance and symmetries. And if you look at that diagram, what you see are patterns that look symmetric or certain types of invariances. And that was a hand-drawn diagram that John Coltrane drew. And my book, The Jazz of Physics, was really uh, an exploration of and trying to figure out and decode what John Coltrane did and go a little bit deeper. And we'll talk about that in, um, in, this, in this colloquium a little bit. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on like, um, so these are the three people that really had influences on me, but many other, I mean, including my own PhD advisor, Robert Brandenberger. When I was a graduate student, Robert made it clear that it was important to, to honor your hobbies. And like, um, so he encouraged me, and you know, I could have imagined having an advisor that said, stay in the office for 15 hours a day and calculate away and don't leave. But in case there were times Robert were like, you know, why don't you go and play your saxophone or, you know, I, I, and he would even come to my, my uh, jazz shows from time to time with, with a whole bunch of physics papers. And I remember people in the audience looking at this guy, like doing calculations while listening to the jazz show. Um, and, they were, you know, I think Robert what, captured the attention of some onlookers more than me. <laughs> so, so anyway, the point, the important point of that lesson is that as I progress along from a youngster to then going to college, right, and majoring in physics, I still um, try to, um, even though I was inspired by these individuals, I still very much kept my physics life and my music life separate. Um, what does that What does that mean? It meant so. For example, even though Robert encouraged me to play, I didn't really, I felt still, well, people are not going to take me seriously as a physicist if they found out that I was like really serious about my music. And so I had to, I had to, I had to resolve that somehow. And that happened when I moved to London to the Imperial College. And when I went, so luck may have it that on my, uh, in my neighborhood, I lived in a place called Notton Hill in London, and I would walk to work and cross Hyde Park to go to Imperial College. And I became friends with this musician, this producer. Uh, and many people don't know who this guy is. If you probably notice many people you know here, that's um, U2 and that's David Bowie. But the, the guy up there with the shiny hair, that's, that's Brian Eno. And Brian Eno was the person that I became friends with. And he is one of the great producers of his time, music producers and co composers. And, also, and one of the things that I learned from Brian, Brian Eno, is also famous for um, the following thing. So what we're looking at here to the left um, is something called a cellular automata. It's an, uh, basically, you look at these squares. Um, this was a kind of mathematics that was explored by mathematician John Conway in the so-called game of life, where you have simple rules. And from these simple rules, once you specify these rules and let the, let these, um, the rules uh, flow out, to the right, you see a beautiful picture there, a piece of a work, a work of art. And Brian Eno was taking these ideas and using this to generate art. Um, and this falls into a category of even music that Brian Eno um, was at the forefront of called generative music. So what's the lesson there? And I, the lesson I learned from Brian Eno was that even though he was not an expert, 
at the mathematics. He bravely would engage with that mathematics and, and science, scientific ideas, to inform his music. And that really inspired me to say, well, maybe I should like let my music world talk to my physics world a little bit more and see what comes out of that. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. So blame it all on Brian Eno. If, um... All right, so to do this, it's important that, so many of you know some of the stuff and some of you don't know, but just for closure, I am now gonna provide with you a common language, the tool that's gonna allow us to link music and in particular improvisational music, okay, um, with cosmology and physics. So there's a common language that allows me now to relate these two worlds, to, to, um, to connect these two worlds. And that language is what I consider to be one of the most important ideas of all science and engineering. And this idea is called the Fourier idea, the Fourier transform. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna understand by this slide is gonna um, give us the, the common language so that when I talk about the connection, it's, it becomes clear. So let's talk about this. To the left-hand side, we, we look at um, A, <clears throat> we see two waves that are completely identical. I mean, uh, they, they're identical, but they're, you know, I want to distinguish them by having a dot uh, and a solid line. And we see that these waves, if they were completely, if, if I were to completely superimpose them on top of each other, they will look exactly the same. So imagine that you're at an ocean and, and you see two waves, and these are specific types of waves. These are what we call periodic waves. These are waves that will continue repeating, okay, themselves um, forever. But we're just looking at a piece of this wave and we're, we're in an ocean, we see two of these identical waves overlap and they, um, they um, collide with each other. And to the right, what, what we expect to see if these waves were in phase or they were completely um, superimposed with each other, meaning that the heights matched up with each other and the lowest points that are matched up, that the waves would actually grow in its height or its amplitude. But its frequency or the numbers of wiggles you see would not change. Okay, that's what we call constructive interference or an in-phase um, interference, okay? But if you look to the, the, the bottom there, we see two waves that are identical, but they are not matched up. In, in fact, where the wave is highest and where it's lowest is where it matches up. And if those identical waves um, run into each other, they completely cancel. That's what we call destructive interference. So we're gonna take these two extreme cases and move over to the, the side of the, um, to the B side. And now we're gonna do something more interesting. We're gonna take three perfectly periodic waves and they differ in the number of oscillations and also in the height. And if I add those waves by using the same principle, same idea, of in phase and out of phase, um, constructive or destructive, what ends up happening is that you don't get complete cancellation and you don't get complete amplification, but we get a more complicated wave. Now, it's not necessary or important right now to know exactly the shape of the wave. What I want you to take away here is that when I start adding more and more periodic waves, the resultant wave that, that happens when they when they all collide into each other is that the resultant wave is a more complicated wave. So this is half of the Fourier idea. And let me summarize it. I take simple periodic waves and when they add up, the resultant wave will be a complicated wave. But the magic of the Fourier idea is also you can do the reverse. And if I give you, if an alien civilization sends a very complicated signal to you, you can decipher that signal by decomposing that complicated wave back into simple periodic waves. So in other words, the building blocks of waves, of complicated waves are these simple periodic waves. You can think of these simple periodic waves as sort of the alphabet of complicated waves. I can make complicated words out of simple letters. So the letters are like the periodic waves and the complicated waves are like, wa uh, are like words and phrases in the world of waves and the world of signals. So what does this have to do, of course? So this is right now just about waves, okay? Water waves and electric, electromagnetic waves, light, but also it 
also is the same physics and mathematics is sound waves. So this is just another graph to show that, that um, when I add these waves, I get a more complicated wave. And then if I have a complicated wave, I can take what we call the inverse Fourier transform and get the simple waves that make it up. And this is at the heart of what's going on with your computers and your cell phones and your radio and your synthesizers. So um, since we know things like rap music and electronic music, um, is, um, is based on this thing called a digital sampler. And this is actually, that's um, Dr. Dre to the left, a very a person that made you know, billions of dollars <laughs> using this thing called a digital sampler, which basically can take sound music and, and record it by, by recording the, basically doing what? By actually picking out the individual frequencies and sampling it and reproducing it. And so in fact, what, as what's going on with the sampler at the heart of it is the Fourier transform. Um, okay, so now it turns out that everything I just told you is exactly what happens with instruments. So when I can take a complicated wave and decompose that into a simple periodic wave, when I blow into, this is an idealization of a flute or my saxophone or a guitar, what ends up happening when I, when I, is that this instrument will, will undergo vibrations and inside wave patterns of, of, of air, these are so-called pressure waves, which is nothing more than a sound wave, will set up. And in fact, it turns out the lowest frequency, which is the one to the top here, by the way, can people see my mouse move? Okay, that's good. Yeah. So the lowest frequency will correspond to a wave that basically gets trapped in the instrument. And if I clip that wave in half, that's a, a wave in what we call the Fourier series, which is a, the wave of the next integer. Um, so the, in this case, this will be half, X, is, X denotes the length of this wave. And if I cut it in half, it turns out that that if this wave was a C note, for example, half of the note, half of the frequency turns out to be the octave, which is high C. If I continue to clip the wave in thirds, this will be the so-called perfect fifth or the dominant. If I clip it in fourths, this will be the perfect fourth. And this is what led Pythagoras, you know, um, roughly in 500 BC to actually devise a system because he had this intuition that the universe, that the planets were playing, the music of the spheres. And he, re he, he got very excited when he took, you know, um, lamb intestines and created an instrument called a monochord, which exactly reproduced the scales of the, the Western musical scales, literally by, um, by um, clipping waves and in, in integer relationships. Well, it turns out much later on, the Bernoulli brothers um, and Fourier realized that the underlying reason that's what happened was because of the Fourier transform. So you see, it's interesting already this interplay we see with um, going way back to the advent of, um, of astronomy and physics, going back to the person that coined the word cosmos, Pythagoras, um, that the musical scale was constructed this way. So the lesson here is that we're gonna be using the physics and the mathematics of wave now to bridge us over now to something more interesting. But I wasn't the first and not the last to start thinking about using explicitly use, using musical ideas to connect to discoveries in physics. Um, Johannes Kepler um, in the 1600s, um, when he got the whole of Tycho Brahe's um, data, he didn't know how to make sense of the data. So he organized the, um, the velocity of the planets in this data um, with musical notation. So at that time, astronomers were all, um, had to all learn music theory. It was part of their education. So he used this music theory as one of the tools of investigation. And it was through that, you see that that's his handwriting here, where he maps out the musical scales associated with the relative um, velocities of the planets that led him to Kepler's laws which was the first set of quantitative equations that had to do with planet, with, um, with astronomy. So Kepler, through the use of using musical analogies, 
um, became known to us as the first astrophysicist. Okay, so we're going to do now a similar game. Now we're going to play a similar game to now say, can we use some kind of musical intuition, musical analogies, to um, to see cosmology in a new light? Okay, no pun intended, because that's how cosmologists actually come to know some things about the universe. Is we look at light. So what we're going to look at now is not just planets, but gazillions of planets. So what we're looking at here, in fact, in my book, I think there's a chapter um, that features Robert Brandenburger because Robert was the one that got me interested in to say that a big part of cosmology is, well, one of the main goals is to understand this picture. This is a computer simulation that agrees very well with the data of what we call a large scale structure of the universe. So we see this web-like pattern of light. The question is, what is this thing? Well, if you zoom in right here to this box and I zoom out and I continue zooming in, what we see is that at the node of that, this network and of, um, of light, every dot corresponds to a galaxy, okay? So like our own Milky Way galaxy, which contains billions of uh, hundreds of billions of stars, what we're looking at is a large scale structure of that we see a pattern in of how these galaxies are organized. And a big part of the physics uh, of cosmology is to understand how the laws of physics could allow for the emergence of the structure and also the emergence of, the, of, of, of galaxies and planets and stars and from a universe where these things did not exist. And so that's interesting. What is that physics? And a big part in physics that I, I, I want us to take away is that when you're dealing with a complicated problem, physicists are always interested in actually not, in actually being very, trying to get done. We always want to find the simplest way of thinking about something. We want to look at a physical problem that might appear at first to be complicated or in Kuwait and, and look at, find an angle to look at this problem where all of a sudden it magically looks very simple and elegant where we could, and so one of the tools physicists use is, is symmetry. But the question is, can we use another tool? And the tool we're gonna now use is actually this analogy with sound and music. But before we go there, let, I wanna show you another piece of data that, that we have to confront. And this concerns the early stages of the universe. Um, and the earliest stages of this, the, what we, the picture we were looking at was is a contemporary universe prior to this. But 14 billion years before that large scale structure was formed, the universe actually looked like this. This is a real picture of, and of what we call a cosmic microwave background radiation. It is what we call the baby picture of the universe. Let me explain what this, what this picture is of. The picture comes about because back in the early stage of the universe, the universe had been expanding from a very hot and dense state of energy and radiation. And as the universe expanded, it cooled, right? But what we're looking at here is, is a picture of the universe when it was very, very hot, okay? How hot? Roughly, you know, the surface temperature of the sun, but that's pretty hot. But the other interesting fact there is that the temperature was the same everywhere, except I want you to think of this picture as like, imagine the universe like as was an ocean of, of, of hot energy, but then at the surface of this ocean were waves, okay? Of, of fluctuations and undulations of this energy. And what we're looking at here, this red and blue, were these were the heights and valleys of the undulations of this waving of radiation. And physics, and it, it, it's a tiny undulation. And if you look at it, I remember the first time I looked at this picture when I was a grad student, right? It looks very chaotic, it makes no sense. What we want to understand is how these tiny waves became the large scale structure in the universe. And what is the physics that underlies these waves? But if you look at it, is there an angle that we can look at this complicated picture to where the physics reveals itself? What is that physics? Okay, and now we're gonna use our tools to understand this. But to understand this, I want us to return back to how instruments work. As I said, that if I blew into my flute, 
I gave you a very simplistic picture. I told you that the flute is vibrating at, um, at one frequency and I produced one note, but I lied. Turns out that the flute is, is when I blow into an instrument like a flute or I play a violin or any interest in instrument, it vibrates with what we call a variety of frequency or a spectrum of frequencies, a spectrum of undulations. So in other words, it is that complicated wave that I talked about with the Fourier idea, but we are not to be afraid because what we can always do is decompose the complicated wave and find the most dominant waves, the most dominant tones and notes. So what we're looking at here is on the vertical axis here is the loudness. If I blow into a flute, in this case, I'm playing the, the G note. So I'm not gonna play the note. The, that's probably, that's not G, but that's my, that's my G. But when I play the G note, the flute is actually playing the G note the loudest, so you're hearing the G note, that's, that's where it is here. And the horizontal axis, every point here, will correspond to a given oscillation or frequency that is being played by this flute. And we notice that when the flute plays a G note, it plays a range of frequency all at the same time. Your ear hears this, your brain um, hears this. You know, people, um, musicians sometimes call this a formant, right? It hears or a timbre, but it hears a particular frequency, the loudest, and we hear that as a G note. But how do we hear all these other notes? We don't really hear those other notes. We hear maybe, we hear some resonant, re resonated notes, but what we hear is the signature. It's what makes the flute sound like a flute or a saxophone sound like a saxophone. So it gives you the information, the sonic information that you perceive all these other frequencies as the sound of the instrument, okay? So the highest frequency gives you the tone, the fundamental, the, the note that you're hearing, and the other frequencies combine together to give you the timbre or the signature sound of that instrument. You know, the flute sounds more metallic. And so what does that mean? These other peaks here will give me information about the geometry as well as the, the material makeup of the instrument. So um, to summarize, when an instrument, to know that if I'm dealing with an instrument, imagine if I, unfortunately, um, I, I, I'm deaf. I can, know, I can know about an instrument by looking at what we call its power spectrum, which is the amount of loudness or power um, of the vibrating object in this case, um, and the range of frequencies. I can look at these different sig um, signatures, right? these um, different um, characteristics and tell you that's a flute or that's a saxophone. Or, and I could use this actually, material people use this to, um, to find out the material makeup. Okay, so let's play the same game for, since I don't know the physics of this, I did tell you that it was, that, this, that the early universe was waving with this complicated pattern of radiation waves, but the, you know what? Radiation the, is, a, is, is a system that carries pressure. So any wave that has pressure is actually a sound wave. So the CMB is actually oscillating what appears to be a, kind of, a chaotic symphony, as you look at it here, of these sound waves. But what if I were to then take the Fourier transform and do exactly what I did for my instrument? What do I get? I get this. And if you look at this, it looks like the instrument, the, this is the representation of, um, of the sound waves of the CMB, but seen through the lens of the Fourier transform. And to our pleasant surprise, and this was expected by a cosmologist named Jim Peebles, where before we even had this data, he thought about the universe actually as fluctuate as sound waves, and he calculated this red curve using Einstein's theory of relativity coupled to this radiation. And the black dot here is nothing more than the, than the experimental observation. And so that won Jim Peebles, the Nobel Prize in physics, um, not too long ago, I think it was last year um, or two years ago, 
Um, but the point here is that the physics is really correct that the universe is functioning as a simple instrument. What do I mean by that? In this case, let's push the analogy further. The peak is a fundamental note, which corresponds to the geometry or the size of the instrument. In this case, remember, that's the, the, the size where the largest wave will fit in the instrument. And from that, I could determine the size of the universe. So once we measure the peak, it turns out cosmologists knew we were looking to find the size of the universe at that time at the CMB existed. And it turned out to agree bang on with the observation. These other peaks, if you believe the analogy with an instrument should reveal the material makeup of the instrument. And it turns out that cosmologists knew even back then in the eighties and the early nineties when this data was realized that there should be the material makeup of the universe is not only the stuff that you and I are made up and the stars are made up, that there's dark matter and dark energy. It turns out that the vibrations of the universe reveal that the material makeup had to be something like dark energy and dark matter. So this analogy and even Pythagoras' intuition that there's music of the sphere may not have happened for planets, but it seemed to be happening for actually the entire universe. How much time do I have? Um, I'm going to pause now because I'm done with sort of like the main thrust of my talk. You have um, and I wanted to leave some time. Um, I know I had 45 minutes. Yeah, you have 10 minutes. Oh, okay, good. I'm going to use the next 10 minutes and I'll talk about another aspect of the connection between physics and, and, and jazz and music. And now we're going to go from the, uni the cosmic scales to the scales of the tiniest, the quantum scale. Oh. Did I lose something here? Uh, you stopped sharing your screen. I need to share it again. Okay. I think I pressed it wrong. Okay. So now I'm going to look at um, the following thing. Wait, where is my slide? Yes. Um, um, actually, what, what I'm going to do is pause for a question or two before I move into part two. And um, there's a, and I have to set something up, a particular thing. So let's pause yeah, no for problem. a question or two. So if anyone okay. on YouTube wants to ask a question, feel free to type it into the YouTube chat. Uh, it'll be sent to me by my uh, collaborator. If you're interested in asking a question on Zoom, uh, so feel free to type it into the Zoom chat and I'll try to read it out. Uh, so we'll have in-person questions at the very end, uh, at the end of the talk, if you want on Zoom. I don't see any questions coming up yet, but I'm sure there are some. Okay. So there, there is a question. Let me see if I can. Okay. So uh, <laughs> let me, let me, let me just do something here. Okay. I, I'm going to change the security settings so that this person can unmute. Okay. So Jim Klein, uh, please unmute and ask your question. Hi, Stefan. Hey, Jim. Uh, so, good to see you. So that was Kepler who uh, had these melodies associated with the celestial bodies. Was that right? That's absolutely correct. And, and how did he arrive at these melodies? Do you know? Yes, I do know, but it's, it's, uh, that's discussed. It's, a, it's, it's kind of involved. Okay. But it's discussed in my book in some detail, but another book is um, Peter Pesek wrote a book called Music and, the Make Science, Music and the Making of Science, where it goes into great details. But in, in a nutshell, Kepler looks at the aphelion and the perihelion and looked at the velocity of the planet and took their ratios the same way I would take the ratios um, of, 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 a, of, a, of a frequency, right, to get the note. And that's more or less of how he was trying to associate the velocities of, a, um, of, um, of the planet and the frequencies. But even at that time, he didn't even know about the relationship of a dispersion relation. So it was purely intuition, um, you know, intuitive. Thank you. OK, we've got a yeah, great couple question. more questions. Yes. We have a couple more questions in the Zoom chat, if you want to go to those. So first one is, thank you for the talk. Is there a parallel between tonal versus modal jazz and modern physics? Um, the answer is yes. Yes, and, um, um, and um, the answer is yes. And the way to think about this is um, um, the minute, so the minute um, we specify the Fourier series and we have the major, like the, um, you know, as you know, we have the, um, the um, diatonic or the Ionian mode, which is the, our major scale, 
then it gives you all the other modes, as we know. So in that, it's in that sense that this relation to the Fourier series um, looks more like a modal system than a, than a tonal system, in my, in my opinion, that is. But that's a great question. And worth actually, worth exploring some more. Okay, thank you. There's one other question in the chat, if you want to keep going with these. Yeah, keep going, more questions, yes. Presentation. So uh, next question is, you showed the geometrical underpinnings of Western music. What do other musical traditions use as musical notes? That's a great question. Um, and so I, I think one interesting thing, and this is very, um, this is controversial, but I have a strong opinion about this because I also am a big fan of classical Indian music. And one of the, one of the things that my friends who play, you know, who play classical Indian music tell me that even though they have a, say, they may have a different system or a different way of codifying the system, physics is still present there. Uh, you know, instruments are still vibrating um, the way they're vibrating. And at the center of all that is actually the, the you know, the, the Fourier series, the fundamental, which is, you know, whatever key I'm in, and the dominant or the perfect fifth. The perfect fifth, which is the most resonant um, for the most resonant mode um, is the one that's always resonating alongside with the tonic is also seems to play a key role in all in other forms of music. And another way where we can see this is that there's a scale that is based on the perfect fifth. There's one scale that can be generated. The same way if you think about group theory, I give you a, an, an element and I continue, I give you a number, I multiply that number, I continue multiplying, I get all the other numbers. It turns out that if you take the perfect fifth and and the and and your home note, I can generate by sequentially generating other perfect fifths from that other perfect fifth, right? It turns out that the scale you get is one of the most common scales. It's the universal scale across different cultures called the pentatonic scale, both the major and the minor. And one of the things I like to, I the way I think about the blues, the blues is nothing more than the minor pentatonic scale with one note, the blue note, which is the, the minor fifth. So the, that is generated just from pure physics, just from pure harmonics, right? So to answer that question, I would say that look to other cultures, we see that they, most of them are using this pentatonic scale as, as you know, in their music, Chinese music, um, you know, I mean, all over the place. So, um, so that's my way of my way into that. Um, but Obviously, there are differences, and those differences um, is what makes music so beautiful and is to be respected. Um, so now um, I'm ready to continue on with the okay. with the last part of my uh, my talk, which is we're going to talk about now some new connections, which is a quantum connection. These are some things that I, you know, in my journey, I was forced to to think about this. Now let me tell you. You say, well, why is this idiot? I'm sorry, uh, I shouldn't have called myself an idiot. Why is this guy? Um, playing this music thing, and this stuff is all obvious to me, or what's the use of this anyway? And for me, aside from it being a lot of fun, <laughs> um, and basically engaging two things that I, I'm, I'm passionate about, it turns out to me there is a use. Because oftentimes in physics, one of the things we struggle with is not just a mathematical realization or representation of the physics we oftentimes struggle with the interpretation, what we call the ontology. And one of the issues still that we face in, in quantum mechanics, when we, quantum mechanics works really well, it's the most, it is the most precise theory we have, but it is also uh, in terms of how we should interpret quantum mechanics, one of the most vexing things, and I'm sure if you bother any of the physicists, if you bring any physicists at McGill University together in a room um, from different floors, and get them arguing about quantum mechanics, they'll be at these other throats, okay? Including those that say, shut up and calculate, okay? And this debate has been going on by some of the greatest minds in physics. They still continue to debate and argue about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. So I said to myself, well, can we look at quantum mechanics in some ways through the lens of improvis jazz improvisation? And that's what we're gonna do now. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully I'll pick up the right slide here, okay. And now I'm gonna um, go into enter full screen. Can you can you all see the slide? Yes. Okay. Now what we're looking at here in the slide 
is to the upper right hand. So <clears throat> for, I want us to focus on the upper right hand corner. When Richard Feynman won his Nobel Prize, he won it for, of course, um, a theory called quantum electrodynamics. But for him to have even done that, he had to re reformulate quantum mechanics in a way that honored this, the, this new beautiful symmetry that Albert Einstein discovered called special relativity, the so-called you know, thinking about physics happening in the arena where space and time are unified, where we have space time rather than space and time separately. And to do this, Feynman <clears throat> had to basically construct an object called the Feynman propagator or the path, into, which is part of this object called the path integral. What does that mean? It means that we look at, we focus on trajectories of a quantum particle and figure out what is quantum about these trajectories. And so to understand that, we need to see the difference between um, how Feynman will tell us what is the difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. To the left, we see in the classical world, in the non-quantum world, in the world of baseballs and hockey sticks, since I'm talking to Canadians, um, 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 and ice skaters, <laughs> we see that in that world, um, if, I, if I look at the trajectory or the motion of a particle, um, it will, in the classical world, if, the, if I take a particle and I, a ball, and I throw it up, you know, vertically, and what, that, what we will see is what we call a unique trajectory, not, right, a unique and also a deterministic trajectory, meaning that if I knew everything about the initial position and when it happened, I can uniquely determine um, by using some equations called Newton's, equa Newton's laws, the final trajectory. So the takeaway in the classical world, if I throw something, you will see it traverse a unique trajectory. So far, so good. You're like, yeah, tell me something new. All right. This is where things get really weird. Richard Feynman taught us in a quantum world, if I look at an electron, if you, if you do his math, his path integral, in order to recover the experiments that we see, like I'm talking about what experiment, the way your cell phone works, it uses this kind of physics, so we know it's right, that the, this one measly electron, quantum particle, has to traverse not just one path, but this other path and this other path. And in fact, it has to, according to this math, what seems to be going on is that this one electron, not many electron, has to traverse all possible paths that connect the initial and the final. But that's weird because when last have you seen, you know, you know, um, your friend appear to be many places at the same time? There's something wrong. This does not coincide with how we experience the world, but that's okay because the world we experience is a classical world. But this is very, very weird. And this is where a lot of physicists would maybe, maybe disagree. They will say, well, the particle is not really doing that. It's just a math. Just shut up and calculate. Or, well, what's really going on is that there's many worlds out there and we, we just see one. And there are all these things. And this falls into the category of issues called the measurement problem um, in quantum mechanics, right? That's what's, it, and the real question is, what is the electron really doing? Even though the math, it seems that it has to be doing something like this to get the right experimental answer. And what, what I'm really saying is that in order to re get back what we see the electron doing in the atom or in, in bond and all these things, um, it has to seem to be, you have to consider all these possible paths. But what the question really is, what is the electron really doing? And now we're going to turn to jazz music to maybe get a, a, um, some insight maybe at a different way of interpreting what is going on. And so it, when I was writing my book, I consulted with, a, uh, I had the fortune to consult with a musician, a jazz legend named Sonny Rollins. And he was very generous and he spent, we spent many hours and he would tell me things. I even recorded the talk and had it transcribed. And one of the things I asked him, I said, you know, cause you know, it's like, he's like a big, I'm a big fan, I'm a saxophone player. And all saxophonists, when we think about Sonny Rollins, we think about this like, harmonic genius, this person who's able to play through chord changes in impeccable ways. And we always would th thought that Sonny Rollins must be, 
must have so much theoretical knowledge and all this stuff. So I spoke to Sonny, I asked him this question. I said, Sonny, um, how did he do it? How are you able to play through these chord changes and master all these like, you know, harmonic progressions? He goes, well, Stefan, I'm gonna let you into something. I don't really think when I'm playing, when I'm improvising. I said, well, what do you do? He goes, well, you know, I practice a lot, but when I get out there, I don't, I don't think, I forget it all. But he gave me a, he gave me a, 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 a tip. He goes, but here's a tip I'm gonna give you of how to, how to play through the chord changes. And now I'm going to give you the tip. What we're looking at down here is a is actually a transcript, a little transcription of one of Sonny, Sonny Rollins' improvised lines. And what we see is the beginning here. The beginning note is a um, is a D, and the last note is a G. Now, what Sonny Rollins revealed to me is that in the middle of an improvisation, he is aware of the first note that he's going to play. And the last note, and he does not care about what happens in between. He is just, right? So I want you to think of this beginning note as my classical particle at a, from initial position and my final note here as my final particle. And what Sonny is telling me is that the improvisation, what happens in between could have been any possible path between this beginning point and the end point. So an improv Improviser actually gets many attempts, actually, as the music cycles through, as the rhythm section cycles through, to play these different targets. So this is a technique called targeting in jazz improvisation. It doesn't look like this, this thing. It actually looks like, like the other. So that got me thinking, well, maybe one way to interpret the path integral is that the electron, as it traverses point A to point B, is actually not really this probabilistic thing or not really this, it's many electrons at the same being it, but the electron may be improvising as it goes from point A to point B. It could have considered, so it's considering all possible paths, right? But improvises its way. And maybe that's, um, one, that's one way we can think about quantum mechanics. And anyway, um, I'm gonna end my talk by just saying, by, you know, saying that um, there's lots more analogies I think to be made. And I also don't think that it, it, it has to only be specific to physics and music, but I think this analogy is way of like connecting, you know, one, one field of science maybe to something else in the arts can reveal new ways of thinking about your subject matter. And so I engage you all and invite you all to continue um, um, with my, you know, continue with this way, going back to Kepler and Pythagoras and even Albert Einstein by continuing with the analogies. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, before we go on to the question and answer uh, session, please, if you enjoyed the talk, write something in the Zoom chat. If you're in the Zoom session, if you're watching on YouTube and you enjoyed the talk, please write something in YouTube. I'll be able to share the transcript with Professor Alexander at the end. And so he'll be able to see all of the well wishes that you're, you're giving, even if you can't see the chat right now. Uh, and I've reserved a couple of questions that came up that we didn't get to in the Zoom chat from our question interlude. Uh, but if you would like to ask a question in person and you're in the Zoom session, please use the raise hand feature and I'll kick you off. Uh, if you're in YouTube and you want to ask a question, please go ahead and type a question into the YouTube chat. It'll be passed on to me. So uh, should we get straight into the questions? Yes. All right. Uh, so a couple of the questions that are left over from our little question interlude. Uh, the first one, uh, is uh, the connection you mentioned is about the linear part. Uh, what about the nonlinear part? Uh, I'm, I suspect this is a reference to the analogy to Fourier transforms, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what um, <clears throat> um, the, I mean, it is true that, you know, um, so yeah, the nonlinear part. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very good question. I I have um I I would say that th that um there are there are nonlinear aspects to um and I think that falls more into the category of um, free jazz and free jazz or you know electronic music and there are all other forms of music where it's not only about you know about notes right but it's also about sound and rhythm right. Um, and um, so 
that's a place where I think some of the nonlinearities um, might come into play. Yes. That's okay. a good question. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question, also from our uh, question interlude, and I know we've got a lineup of people that we'll try to get to uh, in Zoom who would like to ask questions in person. Uh, the next question from the Zoom interlude, uh, sorry, question interlude was, um, uh, are there trends in the power spectrum across mellow tone versions of instruments? Like if a more dark mellow tone on sax has comparable transformation to a dark mellow tone on trumpet? Um. I'm not familiar. Um, first of all, I need, if, if I can have, I'm not familiar with the, I've heard the terminology melatonin, but um, maybe I can, we can return back to that question after the, um, the questioner maybe can give, give me a definition of that. And, and let's, sure. for the time being, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, if that was your question, please go ahead and raise your hand uh, and I can let you unmute and you can ask it in person if you're in the Zoom session still. Um, so uh, I'll just modify the security settings so that people can actually unmute. Uh, and the first question uh, will come from uh, Finn Petrovich, who I think asked this question. So yeah. please go ahead and unmute. That yourself. was uh, my question. Yeah, like when you, uh, for example, you like open up the back of your throat or play with a little bit more lip on your reed, so you get like a more breathy, fatter tone, right? Yes. A more mellow, dark kind of tone. Okay, um, yes, yes, yes. Very good. So uh, I'm asking basically like if you take like the ordinary power spectrum for a saxophone, and then mm -hmm. you as the player kind of transform your sound to be more dark, more mellow. Um, mm -hmm. Is like the transformations on that power spectrum comparable to the transformations on every single instrument's power spectrum? Like on trumpet, you start playing with more lip or however they do it on trumpet? Yeah, it's a good question. It depends on, on if, I mean, for me, I think it's a question of recon also, one needs to also reconstruct the phase information, right? And um, I, I, I want to, yeah, I'll need to think more about that. That's a great question. Um, I don't have a, a direct answer for that um, because there is a question of, you know, I mean, the power spectrum is giving me information about the amplitude and the frequencies, but there's also phase information as well that mm -hmm. could be encoded in what you're talking about. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'll go to one quick YouTube question and then we'll go back to questions from Zoom. Uh, so from YouTube, uh, I wonder if there are connections between the quantum nature of wave functions and this sea of sound waves from the cosmic microwave background. So do you see any connections? Um, yes, in fact, um, one of the things I did not have time to talk about was the source of these. Um, and this is, you can always, you can go to um, some of our local experts um, at McGill, um, Professor Brandenburg and Professor Klein can tell you more that it is believed, we have good we have to believe that actually the origins of those sound waves actually happen from a quantum, a, a quantum phenomenon called cosmic you know, inflation, or even from the from string theory in Robert's, one of Robert's theories uh, called um, string cosmology. But either way, we believe that the origins of these fluctuations, these sound fluctuations, were um, sourced by quantum fluctuations um, in the early universe. So the intuition is right on. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question in Zoom uh, from Iman Egan. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi there. Hello. Um, so given uh, the project of uh, drawing analogies between um, music and, and physics, which is a very precise endeavor, uh, specifically the, the um, scale generation. Uh, how, how, would, would, would the, how would you interpret the Pythagorean comma in terms of uh, precision? Or do, would you just overlook it or would you try to work that into your analogy? Good, I would, I would embrace it. I totally would embrace the Pythagorean comma, which is basically this idea that equal temporal is really not how instruments really work, how naturally vibrating objects work. And you could never really, really like, you know, and I would say that I think what's interesting about that actually is another question that um, our, the Nobel Prize winner this year, Roger Penrose and often um, people like Eugene Wigner, which is there seems to be this very weird thing that at least some physics or some of fundamental physics directly maps onto certain mathematical representations. So there seems to be this idea Realized world of mathematics and the physical world that maps into it 
and the extent to which the mathematics is really matching on to the physical world or almost matching on, I think is a similar type of game with a similar thing in the musical world and the, and the way that some of these, some music is, you know, imperfectly, you know, um, matched on and the coma is kind of telling us something about that. I think it's a very deep question. I don't think we, yeah, I think it's, <laughs> there's something deep there and I think one way in is to actually look at this analogy between physics and math itself. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, uh, next question uh, comes from Ravia Seibold. And uh, if you've already asked your question and you're done, please lower your hand so that others get a chance to come to the talk. Ravia, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you for the beautiful talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I have a question that is a little bit tricky to phrase, but I'll, I'll just try. So um, I also make a lot of music, though not like on your level at all. Um, and for me, physics is very, very intellectual and music is like more about body feeling and, and emotions. Um, so you, you brought a lot of like intellectual examples basically of, of how like music knowledge can in that can has connections with physics but what about these like different aspects of personality do you like do you see that the same and how how does it influence your your physics or how do, does the physics in uh, influence your music yeah that's a great very good that's a very good question i mean at the end of the day the analogy can go but so far and i do think that you know what's from, what's from music is from music and that's what makes music unique and a, a very human thing right um, is that that whole that whole other world about about music? Um, you know, the emotional, the spiritual, the human, um, the connect, how music brings us together in ways that other things, other um, other human things, activities don't. But another, but one place uh, that I did explore is actually, you know, how musicians um, how musicians work together. Like you know, for example, in jazz music the kind of like inclusivity of jazz, the way that jazz musicians come together, like in a, in a group improvisation, right? To play together. So this is idea, first of all, that anybody can come on the stage and play, is invited to come on. And, and the rest of the band, as you're improvising and doing your solo, the rest of the band, right, is supporting that. And then when it's the other person's time to solo, the rest of the band supports that. And you know, in some schools of physics, where I think really good physics is done, we see a similar thing going on, which is like, I mean, Robert was like that, right? and working in Robert's group, Robert Brandenburg's group, it was kind of like a group improvisation, like, you know, one person would say some crazy idea, but it, the, the, the other physicists in the group would, wouldn't say, that sucks, like, you're wrong, like, you're an idiot, it would be like, they would take it as if it was a jazz improvisation, and throw it back at you, that's like, you know, and then and then somebody else will take that idea. It's their turn to solo with that idea. And so it's kind of interesting that where, what I, where I think really good physics is done is where it starts looking like that kind of group improvisation found in jazz music. And that we can learn a lot. We in the scientific community could learn a lot from musicians and how musicians collaborate to make music. We can look at that because especially where great music is made and learn from musicians, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go to uh, a question from YouTube, and then we'll have one more question from Zoom, and then uh, it will be time for the après colloque for those who are in the Zoom session, and for those who have faculty positions uh, will be asked to step away. Uh, so the question from YouTube is, uh, I would be interested to know how quantum Monte Carlo methods for computing integrals uh, could be improved by knowing more about these so-called reference points. Are you there, Stefan? Yeah, yeah. Say one more time, it dropped out, sorry. Yeah, so the question uh, I, is, I would be interested to know how quantum Monte Carlo methods for computing integrals could be improved by knowing more about these so-called reference points. Reference points, you said? Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to know what uh, what's meant by reference points in this context, uh, um, and it's a very, otherwise it's a really good question. And I, so I'd like to know what what's meant by reference points. 
Yeah, I think uh, I'm afraid we don't have time to get clarification from the YouTube question asker, but but, uh, but the Monte Carlo thing is very interesting, though. I think that's you know, I think one of the interesting things is to take some of this um, quantum Monte Carlo stuff. If and I think that's a good place to analyze. It's probably being done, but to analyze um, musical like you know creations, right? Musical compositions. Okay, like in the Zoom chat, we have a suggestion that the maybe the reference is to targeting the improv improvisation technique. Oh, uh, I, that's a great idea. I mean, that's a very good idea. I, I think it should be pursued. Okay, uh, so the last question of the evening uh, before the après colloque uh, comes from Hubert Jean Grandblay. Could you please unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes. Hi. Thanks for uh, thanks for your. Yeah, you're really inspiring um, talk. In fact, I'm still thinking about all of this. Um, I come uh, more from a background of philosophy and music. Mm -hmm. And um, well, a lot of things that you brought uh, connects with uh, one philosopher. Uh, I don't know if you know him, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. I know the, uh, I know the name. Uh, yeah, which, important philosopher. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was a friend of Russell, and he, he, yes. he had a discussion with Einstein. And um, well, I'll try to, to to bring a question like following a white Indian perspective of your talk from, the, but I think it, of course, will be further yeah. discussion. Yes. yes. So um, I'll be curious uh, if I take just one example. You mentioned uh, the improvising electron. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more on? Uh, all the potential movements of that particular electron. What's the relation between its actual movement, what he like effectively does, mm -hmm. and the potential uh, movements? What what is the influence between the two in its life, in its trajectory? That's a great question, and I would just say that 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 question, you know, that that uh, it, what you're doing is pressing, uh, you, you're, pr you're taking this analogy and pressing the ontology now, um, uh, taking it further. I think that's the next step in that question, right? And there's this notion of something called the quantum potential, that this is, there's this other non-local influence that's an impact in the, the thing that you're seeing, right? The thing that is local in this case is the electron. It cannot have its you know, motion without a non-local quantum potential. and you know, although many people, one interpretation of quantum mechanics is not the most popular amongst particle physicists, for example, is done by David Bohm, this so-called Bohmian, um, you know, and De Broglie Bohm thing where this non-local quantum potential, which is kind of guiding the electron it's in, in its improvisation, um, but you can't see it, it's not, in, it's not explicit, it's implicit, um, my, is, is, reminds me of what you're asking. So non-locality. Hmm. The non-local influence on the local electron. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Complementarity. Thank you. Good, great question. Okay. Thanks a lot. And if there are students and postdocs and others who don't have faculty positions in the audience who would like to ask more questions, please stick around. Uh, in the Zoom session, you'll have more opportunity to, to discuss with Professor Alexander at the end. Uh, and uh, before I close out the session, just uh, if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and say a few good words about the talk and the question and answer session afterward in the Zoom chat uh, or on the YouTube chat if you're watching. Uh, let Professor Alexander know how much you liked it. Uh, so that concludes this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Thanks to all who have joined us. Please come back next week for a talk by Feryal Uzel from the University of Arizona entitled Black 